The main objective of the javelin throw is to achieve the maximum distance of the implement. The distance achieved by the throw is dependent on three main parameters, the height of release, the angle of release, and the velocity of release. The most important of these is velocity at the release time, as it is the only parameter that significantly correlates with throw distance. Most people think that the strongest arm would be able to throw the farthest. However, the javelin throw is different from all other overhead throws. Rather than a throw, the javelin is an overarm whip and flail motion that uses the entire body. Fling, slip, whip are much more descriptive and imply a more relaxed, sequentially efficient delivery in which the arm becomes involved only after the major muscles of the legs hips, and trunk have been utilized. This is what separates the javelin throw from other overhand throwing activities such as throwing a baseball or football. The best javelin throw of all time was performed by Jan Zelezny of the Czech Republic in 1996. The result was 98.48 meters or 323.1 feet. In second place comes Johann Vetter of Germany in 2017 with a distance of 94.44 meters or 309.7 feet. In third place is Thomas Roller also from Germany with a throw of 93.90 meters or 308.1 feet in 2017. In comparison, the top GPAC javelin throw was 58.4 meters, or 191 feet. The majority of GPAC throwers measure anywhere from 140 to 170 feet. This is a significant difference from elite throwers. The first main phase is the approach run. In this phase is the cyclic approach phase. A javelin throw starts with a run-up of 6 to 10 running steps, which help build speed and rhythm for the throw. Then comes the acyclic approach phase, generally the fifth from the last approach step. Following the initial approach, the thrower pulls the javelin and continues with 2 to 3 crossover steps just before the plant and release. A crossover step is when the javelin is extended behind the body and the athlete drives off the balls of their feet. Then comes the pen ultimate step. This is the long final stride into single support phase. This step alone is similar to long jump with the goal to cover as much ground as possible. The only way to do this is to effectively build up speed during the approach. Next comes the release. There are three parts to this phase. The release phase contains the most technical factors that affect the outcome of the throw. First is the single-legged support phase. This phase shifts the thrower's center of mass over the back leg. Next is the double-legged support phase, or the plant phase. This phase allows the thrower to transfer the momentum they built up from the approach into hand holding the javelin. This process begins only after the penultimate step lands and completes the opening of the thrower's hip to the sector. This allows the momentum built to efficiently transfer up through the body and into the thrower's hand holding the javelin. It can be described as a whip-like transfer of energy from hip to shoulder to elbow to javelin. The goal of the release phase is to throw the javelin a maximal distance. Momentum is transferred and full body rotation towards the sector is completed. It is important to note that the throwing arm is only activated at the end of this phase. The javelin is released with the arm extended above the shoulder. Lastly is the recovery phase. This phase is important because it helps to reduce risk of injury and allows for a higher transfer of momentum. The back leg is brought forward to prevent the athlete from moving farther forward down the sector. Now to break it down a little further. As stated before, the approach run phase consists of the cyclic approach and the acyclic or crossover approach. 
An elite thrower's full approach will generally consist of anywhere from 13 to 17 strides. Athletes with less control will move slower and perform less strides. In the cyclic approach, elite throwers will generally have 8 to 12 strides. This is initially where they start to build up their momentum. With their sagittal plane facing the sector, throwers will start down the runway pushing off the balls of their feet while gaining acceleration with every stride. The javelin is held in the thrower's dominant arm, for our purposes the right arm, with the glenohumeral joint extended 90 degrees and the humero ulnar joint flexed 90 degrees. It remains in this position till the crossover phase. The next step is the acyclic approach, also known as the crossover phase. It is generally the last five strides of the cyclic phase. These last five steps are otherwise labeled as crossovers. Key differences separating this phase from the cyclic phase are the pull and the penultimate step. Upon entry into this phase, the thrower pulls the right arm holding the javelin back into its next position. In this position, the glenohumeral joint will be horizontally abducted 90 degrees, and the humeral ulnar joint will be extended back 90 degrees, so that the arm is fully extended and outstretched from the body. The javelin's tip is held at eye level. It's important that the thrower's arm is held steady and high till the release. As the right arm pulls back, the upper trunk rotates approximately 90 degrees so that the thrower's sagittal plane is perpendicular with the sector. The lower trunk rotates at the hips to mirror the movements of the upper torso and shoulders. The thrower should still be pushing off the balls of his feet every stride to maximize his velocity through the run-up. One common error of the crossover phase is slowing down in the crossovers. This is bad for the throw because the thrower is losing velocity. And as we mentioned earlier, the faster the velocity of the javelin at the time of release, the farther the throw. Another common error is dropping the arm, holding the javelin lower than shoulder level. This creates a greater angle of release, which results in a higher but shorter throw. The last step of the crossover phase is the penultimate step, or impulse stride. This step is essentially a crossover with an extra long stride. This long stride sets up the release phase of the throw by positioning the thrower's center of mass over the back leg as the thrower enters his single support phase. This image illustrates what the path of an elite thrower's center of mass during approach through release would look like. Now compare this image in contrast to the first. The common problem made by many throwers during their penultimate step is hopping through the impulse stride. This takes some of the horizontal forces and converts them into vertical forces, which can in turn create a loss of overall force transferred through the release. This path of a thrower's center of mass in an approach creates more braking force. Note that this line is less fluid. Not only do the vertical forces cause a decrease in velocity, but they also cause an instability in the throwing arm, which could result in a bad release. Furthermore, the more vertical displacement in the penultimate step, the more difficult it is for the block leg to get out in front of the body, making converting forces to the javelin more challenging. The goal of the thrower should be to keep the center of mass in line and horizontal to minimize braking speed. The primary muscles used in the approach phase are the soleus, gastrocnemius, hamstrings, quadriceps, and gluteus maximus. After landing the impulse stride, the thrower enters the single support phase. The thrower loads the back leg while extending the front into a bracing plant. As the front leg is extending, the hips are opening towards the sector, all the while keeping the upper trunk's sagittal plane perpendicular to the sector. When the lead leg plants, the thrower enters the double support. Double support and release. The double support 
phase is when the lead leg is planted and doesn't end until the release of the javelin. In double support, it's important for the back leg to drive the hips open to the sector. As the hips rotate through, the thrower hyperextends his rectus abdominis so that his chest is facing the sky. Only after the hips have opened to the sector should the thrower start the release phase of the javelin. It's all about the timing. The final steps of the release phase involve the arms. Just as a thrower finishes whipping his hips through, he uses his left arm to create a counter force for the javelin. This is called the block. The thrower will horizontally abduct his glenohumeral joint using his rhomboids and middle trapezius muscles. As the block arm whips through, the thrower will shift his javelin arm from the horizontal abduction in the transverse plane perpendicular to the sector to hyperextension in the sagittal plane facing the sector. This is possible because the glenohumeral ball and socket joint is especially mobile. This combination of hips open to the sector, chest to the sky, and block arm horizontally abducting creates this characteristic backward C shape. When done right, this is a thrower coiled to the extent of his range of motion with the summation of all the run-up forces transferred into the javelin. Once he's reached this position, he continues to push his back leg into his block leg, flexes his rectus abdominis, whips his throwing arm through, and finally releases the javelin. All of this happens in a split second, which is why it is so difficult to reach an elite level of this event. The optimal angle of release is between 33 degrees and 39 degrees, with 0 degrees being parallel to the ground. The optimal angle has many external factors affecting it, which is why it has a range of 36 plus or minus 3 degrees. The primary muscles used in the release phase are the gastric nemus, soleus, quadriceps, hamstrings, rectus abdominis, triceps, and rhomboids. The most common error is messing up the transfer of forces to the hand holding the javelin. Another common mistake is not throwing the javelin through its center of mass. The recovery of the throw begins as soon as the javelin leaves the thrower's hand. Throwers try to decrease the amount of space that it takes for them to come to a stop. This is so that they don't lose distance off their throw. After the release of the javelin, all of the thrower's focus and energy goes into stopping his momentum from carrying him through the scratch line. Usually this requires one to two steps where the thrower rapidly decelerates. However, sometimes the thrower's momentum is so great that they end up throwing themselves head first onto the runway to save their throw. The primary muscles in this phase involve the quadriceps, gastric nemus, and hamstrings operating in the sagittal plane to keep them from scratching. The most common error of the recovery phase is crowding the scratch line. This is when a thrower plants too close to the end of the runway and is unable to stop himself from scratching the throw. To sum up javelin, it has three main phases, the approach run, the release, and the recovery. It's important to note controlled rhythm, speed, and proper timing of the form are the most important aspects of the javelin throw. The more relaxed a thrower keeps his arm, the faster and more fluid the javelin will be upon release, giving it a farther flight.